Hi everyone, my name is Wana and welcome to Culture Diaries. Now, this week on this edition, my guest, whew, where do I start with the introductions? She is a she's a cultural producer, she's a Renaissance woman. She is someone I've known for a very, very long time. She produces film festivals, she produces concerts, she's a, she runs a moving gallery. She's so many things. Her name is Ugoma Adegoki. Hi, Ugi. Hi, darling. <laughs> now, you guys don't you? know this, but I've known Ugoma for like, it's too many years. Yes. But let's just say since I was about 17 years old. So, girl, oh, no. you've been doing things. Yes, I've been busy. You've been busy. <laughs> You've been busy for over 10 years. Yes. I mean, okay, so it's really, one thing that's really interesting to me, is I, and I, the reason I bring up the fact that I've known you for so long is your background is completely different. Yes. So I, I still remember when you were applying to do your master's exactly. in economics. in economics. <laughs> At Manchester. Remember. Yes. Exactly. And then, but you've always, we've always been lovers of the arts. I think that was where we bonded. We bonded. And um, food. And food, exactly. <laughs> you were taking cooking classes but no, the reason i bring this up is because there's something about when people enter a space especially like creative spaces in terms of producing mm -hmm. culture and producing mm -hmm. cultural and artistic content and there's always this thing about where did they come from what are their credentials yes yes and <laughs> you <laughs> and you've like entered multiple spaces you have a film festival you you, you know you sell arts and yes. you have a you technically have a gallery sort yes, of a moving a gallery, yeah. moving pop-up gallery mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and you also produce concerts and i'm sure in those different spaces this conversation of where, where did she come from, from? Yeah. you know what are her credentials okay. why is she here of course. and i'm sure you've heard that and how how has that what impact has that had on the way in which you do or create your work? Um, well, in terms of like resistance, you know, you're, we're used to that, you know. Um, Nigeria is, well, I think it's a global issue, but in Nigeria especially, there's always this sort of reasons why you shouldn't be in a place as opposed to just embracing mm -hmm. and actually hearing what the person has to say. So, for, um, I mean, my, my, my diversion, complete 360 degree from finance into sort of culture, um, was sparked and led by passion. So, and it's passion that keeps me sort of doing the things I do. Mm -hmm. um, it's passion that takes you from being, being um, focused on just what you learn in a classroom to being someone who's interested in learning in general. So you mm -hmm. read, you teach yourself. And in my mm -hmm. case, it's, it's precisely what I did. I followed the passion and just essentially educated myself, took it upon myself to find out things about this world that I was curious about. Mm -hmm. um, and then self-taught so and so once you feel not being arrogant you must never be arrogant but you feel that oh i'm knowledgeable i'm knowledgeable enough i feel passionately and strongly enough about it then the issue of permission doesn't come up you just do it hmm. you know and you do it and ensure that you you ensure high quality as best you can within your resources and then also just keep sticking at it. And what has happened is, of course, we've stuck, you know, I've stuck at it. So we've gone from, where did you come from? You can't be authentic. I mean, now it's just sort of like, it's, you, would be, you, would be, you would be revealing the fact that you're not aware of the space to say that I'm not authentic. Mm. And, um, and then the education has come. It may not have come formally, but the education has come as a result of the passion. And we're solid and we're, we're serious. And we're not going anywhere. Um, w were there any moments where you felt like you were trying to prove yourself or you had to prove yourself or working through the insecurity of not coming from this formal space of either like running a first film festival and not previously being a filmmaker yes, or being in that yes, film space, yes. you know, and the same thing with arts as well? Yeah, of course. There were, there were times that, you know, we all have our doubts, but what, uh, one of the sort of turning points for me was when I... I went to do a curating course. In, mm. in fact, it was when I went to do a curating course with a lady called Tina Ziegler, who founded the Monica Art Fair. And um, she was doing uh, master classes in Barcelona. And I felt that um, I would attend this. She canceled the, the, the master class. So I went all the way to London, oh, wow. trying to go to Barcelona. And uh, she canceled it because there were not enough people in the class. So I said to her, look, I'm coming to Barcelona anyway. Even if you give me a one-on-one, -on -one, I insisted. I just basically stopped this woman. And in the end, she agreed. 
So I almost like paid double, but I didn't care. I was like, I've come all the way from Nigeria. I'm not going to go back without having met you. But what was wonderful is that she basically made, she made a, a comment and it was basically about what curating then is now and how there's academic lines and those are very important, but also intentionality and um, a very clear mission of what it is that you, you want to set out to, especially in my context, which was a Nigerian context, I'm feeling like I was in a place where there was a the huge hole, culturally speaking. I felt that academically, maybe I need to be a certain type of curator, but based on what I identify as a real, you know, deep hole that is lacking and that I have the ability to fill the space, because of my knowledge, my passion, and my ability to bring people together, and my ability to move people, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny myself of that opportunity. And so, yes, you then create your new standard. And I feel in, with, with sort of curating across the globe, you know, that's also changed. And everything's changed, everything changes, you know. We're moving, we're moving away from the you know, traditional museums. We, you know, there's so many discussions now on museums. What should a museum be? What's a function? So, you know, the conversation will always change. And so you situate yourself in that change because it's gonna happen. And so I felt that placing myself in this almost like self-arrived, self-taught model and feeling the impact and seeing the impact and having the validation from people was enough for me. And it didn't matter what, you know, anyone else said, um, professors alike. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> professors alike, oh, yes, you know. Shade. <laughs> To be. You don't have to be grey, and mm. you know, you know. There's so many, there's so many um, valid, valid things to. There's so many valid reasons that one should decide that they want to be a person that puts things together. Yeah, which is really what a curator is a co providing context. So how how do you describe yourself? Because because I feel like you you run multiple programs yes, and events yes. um, in different capacities as well. Do you define yourself as a cultural producer? Do you define yourself as a curator? What do you define I yourself define as? I define myself as a cultural producer mm. and a multi-arts curator. Okay. Because, um, because, of the, because of why I went into this field, um, the tools are, are I'm a multi-tool person. So visual art is one of many, as you mentioned at the very beginning, you know, the concerts and music and film, because I feel that they're all tools to, to, to tell the same story. Yeah. I'm trying to reawaken uh, the sense of Nigerian-ness and the pride in our Nigerian-ness using the tools of culture hmm. and using the branches of art. So, um, the production is important because, you know, I also have to produce the scenarios and the spaces and the experience in which you can experience these multiple tools. Yeah. So they go hand in hand. So I create the environment and the context and then I situate, you know, um, whatever angles or, or directions I want people to consider. And we do that all the time, you know, and that's what I've been doing since um since you know well we met since we met again yeah. you know and sort of like the life house yeah. which you know is sort of like my origins and, and that's that's where i literally wanted to to for us to go to uh, before before this there was the life house mm -hmm. um and the life house was this just it was just i don't even know how to describe it because it was this like experiential yeah, space it was, it was you know it was like experiential yeah. the word comes up it keeps coming up yeah that's the word it that keeps must, coming up yes yeah. it must and it, it will keep the experiential mm. that word will keep coming up throughout any sort of spotlight on yeah. what i do because the experience is essential mm. um you know it's not um you know, the, the way I communicate is via experience. Yeah. So some people write books. Um, some people, in my case, I create context and space for you to better understand what it is I want you to yeah. feel yeah. or come to know. Yeah. Um, and so it's wonderful that you can describe the life house as experiential and that it's still something, a word that keeps coming up yeah. when people talk about my work or my studio or the festival even yeah i mean i love i mean let, let's go back to the, to the life house particularly and i think i love that it was you there was no limits to what this particular space was you would have um jazz concerts there and afro beats 
concerts, classical, classical music <laughs> concerts. You would have art exhibitions. Mm -hmm. You would have theater, yeah. live book theater, readings. book readings there. I mean, I met yeah. tons of people who have become my friends and yeah. my sisters and brothers and sort of the creative community as well. But I think that's the biggest thing for me. I think you really started building, a, using that space as a community. community yes. It was like a community center. Yes, it was. Building community. And how important was the building of that community, both like the nurturing of the audience and the nurturing of the artists as well. How do you think that has been crucial looking at where we are now in the current like sort of creative and artistic space? Mm. I think it was so, so, it's so important. And um, I think it's the thing that I would love to actually say has been one of the, I guess, you know, providers of sanity for me, just knowing where, mm. where, that, where I'm coming from and sort of my reasons. So, um, of course, the Life House was, you know, run by me and uh, Dayo Adegoke, my husband, um, at the time. And basically, we were always very clear about open source. We were very clear about the fact that we wanted to share. And so sharing was, from the get-go, an essential, integral part of the Life House and what we were there for. Mm -hmm. Of course, both art lovers, both artists in our own right, you know, um, we understood sort of, the, I would not like to use this word, but we understood the plight of the artist and we're extremely sympathetic and understanding the importance for an artist to feel safe and free. So that community built, was built because of course, I guess the reports started to go around, you know, one artist will mention to another artist and that, that's a safe place for you. Yeah. You know, that's a safe place. Um, for you, the artist, it's also a safe place for you as a person who's a receiver and you want to be able to receive art in, in I guess, the purest form that you could possibly experience it, right? Yeah. We weren't interfering, we're not interested, we're bro we, were, we were courageous about what we wanted to experience and what we wanted to express and allow the artists who worked with us to. So fast forward to today, it's amazing because, of course, the space has grown exponentially, there's a lot with social media, with some government eyeballs, and there's a lot of interest in the space, mm. right? And of course, with everything that has a hyper growth, you have your, you know, charlatans, and you also have, I would say, you know, the authentic people. And that community, right? And so there's so many conversations where people can't understand where I go, how, how, I'm, clo how I'm able to achieve some of the things I'm able to achieve, yeah. how I'm able to gather some of the artists, some of the most important artists today are all connected to me from the life house yeah. whether they're in film music um, visual arts yeah. poetry i would say that the the cultural elite of nigeria today we share the life house in common yeah i can i can say that with with full authority and confidence and so it's because of the uh, the it's because of the truthfulness about that initial bond yeah that we are where we are now and those communities still exist. We may mm. not always see, we may not always work together, but there is a respect, there's a camaraderie that, that continues. Mm. And it was, it's, it was started at a time when nobody was looking. Mm. It was started at a time when it wasn't sexy. There was a, it was started at a time when there was not that much money. There's still not that much more let, now. Let, let's go into the sexiness <laughs> of it because I feel like art and culture is sexy all of a sudden. Oh, yes. Right? I mean, look at last year, 2018, um, during the, what do I call, what I like to call the art season mm -hmm. and all the festival mm -hmm. season and like every bank was funding yes. an art event yes. back to back yes. to back. So it yes. seemed like, oh, if this one is doing this, ah, we need to find our yes. own as well. It's and so amazing. all of a sudden it's, it's now, it's now the sexy thing. Um, do you think that has any impacts or effects in how people develop as artists as well? Because there is also for, for, there's a whole gen new generation of young artists who are like, ah, there's clearly money in this yes, thing. Let's go there. Where when we were coming up, it was like, <laughs> you, better, you better be doing <laughs> it because like, you want to. Yeah, do you it. know, people were working in the office and they come, they'll come up to the life house after work and roll up their sleeves and still sing yes, or yes. or play yes, guitar or yes, play drums yes, or whatever yes. it is. Um, do you think that has that like the the sexiness of it now? Has what what for you are the positives and the negatives? Um, just, you know, similar to the statement I made earlier about the charlatans and the authentics. And, you know, everyone has a right um, to be whoever they want. You know, I feel that the world, everybody should be who you are. 
But of course, in terms of like the spaces um, that are selecting spaces, you know, need to also have very need to be need to be authentic because yeah. you need to be able to see through things. You know, you need to be able to see through things. Um, what is what has happened? Like with any uh, overexposed, overhyped space, uh, over sex space, is that suddenly, yeah, uh, artists are develop artists are, are showing up, right? <laughs> <laughs> suddenly, artists are Ex showing up. Express yourself. Suddenly, Don't repress suddenly, yourself. Suddenly, <laughs> people who um, are just having you know a hard time or someone who's just developed like a slight skill to draw or to sing is then an artist as opposed mm -hmm. to a person who has some who has had a, a you know consistent um like development dedication process. and development and authenticity and self-reflection and repetition you know and so there needs to be and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that there no, there's some you know geniuses. There's some virtuosos. Yes, they are. They exist, but there just needs to be a way for us to see, if, so that there's fairness, and so that people do not um, jump cues, mm. so, so to speak, right? Especially in a country like Nigeria, where you know the selection is so blurred, and people that are doing the selecting half of the time don't even know, um, you know. So I think that um, we just need to be, be a bit more observant. Mm. And, but then the, the, uh, the true artists also still need to never stop doing the work. The mm. same work that we did when the, it wasn't sexy and the same reasons you woke up every morning to mm. do that work, you must continue. If not, I, th I think you may even have to do that more now because the space is slightly crowded yeah. and um, there are many um, you know, mis misconstrued ideas about what art and why the, and the reason for art mm. is. And unfortunately, if you're loud enough and, you know, have the right graphic and right, right fonts, then that's all, that's all you need. But I mean, there are also people who would say to something that you're saying now and say that, you know, just because you put suffer the way you suffer doesn't mean that we have to suffer, mm. so to speak. Um, there, I agree, but um, it's not really about suffering, you mm. know. Um, I wouldn't use the word suffering even because really, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to, to walk your truth. You know, in the, yes, there are, of course, there are luxuries that artists who have, who have done that sometimes have lacked. But if you understand um, sort of your place in the world yeah. and the, the place that your, your place in the world when you have, when you are carrying a talent and you are a, a, a griot of something of, of some sort then it's absolutely not suffering mm. it's just what you have to do it's your it's your it's you living your life and living your truth and living your purpose and, and i think i want to talk about the fact that you, this thing you mentioned about you know independent cinema and i i think of i say say two years so far two of two years where mm. the year where you had abba makama's um, green, green white green, green. So you have you always you have a Nigerian film mm -hmm. usually mm -hmm. that is the opening film mm -hmm. for the you mm -hmm. know um, and I think of Kasala by yes, Emma yes. as well yes. and literally you know that festival is the uh, is was literally the only place that we get to see these kinds of Nigerian films yes. brought to a larger audience yes. because traditional channels of distribution would not even give them any room for yes, that as precisely. well and do you see that as one of your mission statements? Um, in terms of heralding independent cinema, people who are doing experimental work, more interesting work, or just different, Even different kinds of work. work. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, we want to be, and we have been in many instances. I'm happy you mentioned Green White Green, Confusion Nawa, uh, Be for Boy, yeah. um, Kasala. Um, and of course, we always try to push the Nigerian film, especially for the for the prominent nights, like the opening or closing night. Of course, mm. we don't buy, we're not biased because we base, we base selections on what is good. What, I, what I'm grateful for is that the Nigerian films have made, have just made it into that selection by themselves. So we're not going around selecting, okay, let's put the Nigerian film first because it's Nigerian. No, we're putting the best films. And yeah. so it's, it's wonderful that the Nigerian- I mean, we're the best though. Yeah, it's, it's, we, we're the best. <laughs> we're, we are, we're not the best. <laughs> We're, we're not the best, but, but we could be the best. Okay. And I think it depends on the time of day. You know, of course, we, in, our in our festival, we've had a lot of South African content in the past. You yeah. know, 
at one point I was getting very worried because, you know, we also then got hit because they're like, oh, you're only showing, you know, uh, you're only showing South African or you're only showing Senegalese, yeah. right? And of course, we, 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 we can talk about Francophone, mm. you know, Africa and its culture of filmmaking and the, the jury's out on whether who makes better films. The Nigerian filmmakers are not, they're not playing. Mm. They're raising the bar. And we've raised the bar because we've also shown you what we consider yeah. the best of independent African cinema. And they've been watching. Again, if those filmmakers were closed-minded, you know, and this is where this being open to knowledge, and I talked about this, you know, if they had been, then they would never improve. You know, because you learn things when you watch other. So filmmakers yeah. must watch other filmmakers' films. You mustn't say because it's not your, it's not your film, you you don't support it. And that's art. You know, you must continue to interact and engage with each other's work so that you can fine tune your own style. You can revise stories or add stories or edit them. Yeah. And I think that it's just been nice to watch that organic entry and rise of Nigerian film input into our festival and to be proud of it and to stand and be like our objectives have not changed we're still about the best of African cinema yeah. and 50% of the films this year thankfully we are proud to see are, are from Nigeria and do you think do you think this festival has been having any impact on on independent filmmaking for for Nigerian filmmakers specifically I, I, who, I, who, who cannot find it are not allowed to find an audience because the system doesn't give them room to do that. We've, we, we've, we, are, we are known as, uh, as the Voltron for the independent filmmaker. Everybody knows that. The independent filmmakers know that. Um, we've been, you know, there are many adjectives I've heard. Um, I've been told we are the festival. I mean, this is Uncle Tam, Fear Furry. It's like you are the ones who return glory to the filmmaker. There's so many, I mean, I have goosebumps now because these are the things that we want to be. You know, you give, you give glory to the filmmaker, you return nobility to the art of filmmaker. These are the things that filmmakers tell us, you know, in our guest book, which I yeah. get to read usually after the festival, and I end up, you know, usually in, you know, some kind of, you know, tearful state at the end of every, every film festival, because it's what we want, you know, yeah. and that's good to be able to um, be a safe place and, an, ex and an, uh, an effective place, because what we're saying is we're saying, look, your film, your expression is valid. Yeah. Your expression is beautiful. Bring it to me. I will put it in, a, in, a, in its rightful place. I will gather for you 300 to 350 people who are important because they are open, they're, they're listening, they're going to talk about it, they're going to be impacted. Well, that's what art is. What an, no artist wants money over impact. If, if, you, if you gave an artist just fame and money and his art didn't have the impact it was meant to, then he would not choose that. And I, and I, I think I can speak for every artist because what they want is to communicate. That's why you go through the effort of making a film and you know, suffering to make the film. You want to communicate. So mm -hmm. we provide, we, we, we're, we've, we're proud that we've been able to provide that. And we've provided that just by sticking to our very simple objective, which is to, you know, be an amplifier yeah. and a loudspeaker for those types of those kinds of films to to or to to confirm that it is valid yeah. it is beautiful it is worth seeing and we want to see it and we want to share it with our audience and we're also cultivating those audiences so they're getting larger and larger and larger so that what we will have eventually is a wider audience yeah. that wants and demands those types of films Something that we both share is the fact that we, we do many things. And so you talked about sort of being a multi-arts curator. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even mention that you're, you're also a fashion designer as well. I was. Yeah, you were a fashion designer. <laughs> no, I'm just a fashionista. <laughs> no, I just so, wear the fashion. So you're, you're a fashion designer at some point. You know, you've done, you're doing music, furniture you do design, furniture yeah. design. Do you ever get overwhelmed? Because I think it's something, it's something that's very important for people who are watching, who, who have so many interests and oftentimes are, are bullied into, you know, focus on one thing or stay in your lane, you mm, know, mm, and, and there's the mm. other side, which is like, you know what, express yourself. Mm. Um, do you get overwhelmed and how do you, how are you able to prioritize? And decide so I do get overwhelmed one, yeah. for you multi-talented people. 
Um, the truth of the matter is that I do get overwhelmed, but I get overwhelmed, I think, because of just the, you know, it's a lot of work. Um, I don't think it's a lot of work because it's very diverse. Because I feel the diversity is actually just, uh, the, is, the diversity is just what it is. It's the, unique, it's the unique identity of my work, which is to create space and context for you to experience the fullness that is Nigerian culture and Nigerian art. So, and, that, and there are many tools and there are many facets of what our culture and our art is, yeah. right? It's music, it's film, it's books, it's thought, it's poetry, it's food, right? It's wood, it's, it's textile. Yeah. So I don't feel overwhelmed because I feel I'm just doing, you know, I'm just expressing myself and I'm amplifying other expressions through these multiple channels, mm. which are all facing one direction, which is to express that, you know, that, that identity, yeah. but in different ways. So it's almost like where I am trying to say expression, but I'm trying to say it in Italian, French, Igbo, Yoruba, and Spanish, mm. but I'm still saying the word, right? Yeah. And so that's how, that's what it is to me. That's what my own work is, yeah. which is why it doesn't feel overwhelming at okay. all, you know? And uh, I actually also feel that it's perfect for me because my own approach to the curatorial, you know, uh, practice. practice is, in my own unique case, multidisciplinary, always using disciplines to, to juxtapose each other. So, and you know from the life house and you know from our interactions, I've always fixed things. Even when I started, even fashion design, which is how fashion design led me to sort of focus more on just, you know, curating in the, in the arts was my style and approach to things was always experiential and using different things together. So there was always film with fashion, music with food, music with fashion. We were always doing that. If you think about, if you remember yeah, the zebra yeah, events, yeah. we always, I've always mixed. I've always mixed because I feel that you can tell a better story when you, you, you layer with music and you, you then buttress with visual art. Yeah. If you're trying to communicate with people and you're trying to make people feel emotion and you want to, com you want to communicate, you communicate with as many layers as you can. And especially in, a, in, our, in our culture, where there's been so much noise, there's been so much trauma, so much dissipation, it's hard to focus. I feel that multi using multidisciplines is actually the only way if you're truly trying to communicate. If you're really trying to communicate, you can't be too purist about it and say, well, I've written that book, go. How do you get people in the door to come and hear the, about the book? I may have to use food to deceive you to come <laughs> into the door. I may have to use, you know, I may have to use a wine tasting yeah. to get you in the door and then I lock it and then I'll tell you mm. what you I, hear this you, know, you know, so, so it's those things. I mean, I'm joking about, you know, but it, it, it's, about, it's about effective communication. Yeah. Bittersweet Symphony. Verve. Ooh, that's an interesting choice. I love it. That is a good song, it's though. A good song. Oh my gosh, that's a very good song. Hmm. Giving away Mr. Apple it was my toy, my favorite toy. <laughs> Sorry. You know, like the look you wore. I was thinking it was really going to be this. You know, Mr. Apple very... was my best friend. Very and intense. I gave it to my cousin, and she, bro she, she actually doesn't know where it is now. We how old, how old were you when you gave Ms. My Apple? mother gave it away, and she didn't ask me. Oh, wow. But I was 11 at the time I let go of okay. Mr. Apple. Move on. And so Mr. Apple is your biggest <laughs> regret. Really? Yeah. Okay, really? Really? Mr. Apple is my biggest regret. I'm not, I, have, I really don't have, I, don't, I cannot recall any regrets. Okay. No. okay. No, maybe like ordering the wrong thing at a restaurant. Those are the kind of regrets I have. Okay, so you don't have any like deep life regrets? No, no, I don't. Okay. I actually don't. Believe more in yourself. Mm. I like that one. Watermelon. Why? Just easy, chilled, and red. Is red your favorite color? It kind of is. On my lips, yes. I believe art can change the world because I believe art is freedom. It's 
it's uh, it's freedom it's access to yourself reconnecting every day with yourself and um, freedom to express like your truth and I feel that art can improve genuinely the state of mind and state of well-being of people yeah and so therefore can change the world thank you Ugi. you're welcome <laughs> you're welcome Thank you all so much for joining us on this episode of Culture Diaries. And big, big shout out to my guest, Ugoma Adegoke, and her wonderful and beautiful space. Look at it, it's so gorgeous. Um, you can follow me online. Um, all my social media details are at the bottom of the screen. Until next time, remember, art is life.